What was the hammer of the waters? Was it an earthquake, a flood, a little of both, or perhaps something far worse? Or are the maesters ever skeptical, perhaps correct in their assertion that the real culprit for the sinking of the Arm of Dorne was simply gradual sea level rise? Not very exciting, but it does happen. And if the hammer of the waters was a great cataclysm, a sudden disaster, was it in fact called down by the green seers of the children of the forest, as legend says? Did the children really conduct some sort of horrific act of mass blood sacrifice and blood magic on the Isle of Faces, again, as legend says? And what about the conflicts in the legends where some say the hammer was called down not from the Isle of Faces, but instead from Moat Kaelin, which, by the way, is the weirdest place in Westeros. Were there perhaps two separate hammer events, or were the Neck and the Arm of Dorne perhaps flooded at the same time? Was the Neck even flooded at all, or maybe has it always been a swamp? And what about the Iron Islands, where we have legends of floods and potential signs of cataclysm lurking about as well? And why is this Disaster Hunters of Ancient Westeros exploration that we're about to do going to lead us to discover the secrets of the uber-mysterious Oily Black Stone. Well, you better watch this video and find out because this is my absolute wheelhouse right here and we're not even gonna use symbolism that, that much. The children fought back as best as they could, but the first men were larger and stronger. Riding their horses, clad and armed in bronze, the first men overwhelmed the elder race wherever they met, for the weapons of the children were made of bone and wood and dragon glass. Finally, driven by desperation, the little people turned to sorcery and beseeched their green seers to stem the tide of these invaders. And so they did, gathering in their hundreds, some say on the Isle of Faces, and calling on their old gods with song and prayer and grisly sacrifice. A thousand captive men were fed to the weirwoods, one version of the tale goes, whilst another claims the children used the blood of their own young. And the old gods stirred, and giants awoke in the earth, and all of Westeros shook and trembled. Great cracks appeared in the earth, and the hills and mountains collapsed and were swallowed up. And then the seas came rushing in, and the arm of Dorn was broken and shattered by the force of the water, until only a few bare rocky islands remained above the waves. The summer sea joined the narrow sea, and the bridge between Essos and Westeros vanished for all time. Or so the legend says. Hey guys, David Lightbringer here. New studio, new haircut. And we're talking about the Hammer of the Waters, one of my favorite topics. And guys, you know that if you've been watching this channel, one of my favorite things that George Martin has done in creating his world building, the world behind A Song of Ice and Fire, is to mimic the way our own ancestors tend to create legends and folk tales around natural cataclysms. So in A Song of Ice and Fire, the cataclysms, of course, tend to be magically induced as opposed to natural, but the cultural phenomena is still the same when man's world trembles, burns, floods, freezes or turns dark, the survivors remember the trying times through their legends and folk tales. Earthquake, of course, is certainly a descriptive and accurate term, but how about, and giants awoke within the earth, and <laughs> that's got some punch. And that's what we call a mythical description of a natural disaster, giants awaking in the earth. The long night, of course, is the disaster of all disasters. And as we learned in the world of ice and fire back in late 2014, uh, the long night was apparently experienced throughout the known world. Or perhaps we might say throughout the half of the northern hemisphere that we see on the big map from the lands of ice and fire. That's right, in case you didn't hear, the long night was not just a Westeros thing. The Roynish experienced it in western Essos, and then the Yeetish and the Ashai also experienced it in far eastern Essos. And somewhat further south of Westeros, it should be noted, so this really is either a global winter in darkness or at least a northern hemisphere winter in darkness. And thus we can look past the more exotic and colorful details of stories about the others and the last hero, or the Yeetish story of the woman with the monkey's tail, or the Roynish one about the turtle and the crab gods singing a secret song to bring back the sun. That's a good one. Um, 
and observe that yes, some sort of global winter did occur thousands of years in the past, one that was significant enough to stand out in the cultural memory of people all around the world. So it definitely happened. Now the hammer of the waters, the collapse of the land bridge between Westeros and Essos, which was known as the Arm of Dorne and is now known as the Broken Arm of Dorne, titles, titles, is another such disaster legend. And it's really the only thing that you can compare to the Long Night, apart from the far more recent Doom of Valyria, which actually qualifies as a historical event since we have eyewitness accounts on record as opposed to 8,000-year-old legends and folktales. So the Hammer of the Waters wasn't quite a global event like the Long Night, although we will talk about the ramifications of altering the major ocean currents later. Uh, the Hammer was a very large regional event, and thus we can use the same sort of disaster hunter approach that we just did for the Long Night to try to begin to determine what actually may have happened here. For example, the first question about the Hammer of the Waters is posed to us by the Maesters later on in the passage that we just quoted from. And they're essentially asking whether we are speaking more about a cataclysmic collapse of the Arm of Dorne or simply about the gradual rise of the ocean levels. Put simply, was there a great flood? Or was this more like the Bering Strait land bridge between Siberia and North America which was open when sea levels were lower, approximately 15,000 years ago or so, but which gradually disappeared under the waves as the planet thawed out from the recent ice age and sea levels rose approximately 300 feet to their current level. There are definitely some loose parallels between the children of the forest and the first men, the Native Americans and the coming of Europeans, so perhaps that's part of George's inspiration. I would say that it definitely is. So maybe it was a gradual rise in sea level, like, like the Bering Strait land bridge. But the thing is, this is a fantasy novel, and since we know that the Maester's skepticism regarding all things magical is kind of written into the story as an in-world plot device, we're initially inclined to think that there probably was a disaster. I mean, it's just the more fun answer, right? And it's kind of consistent with the Maester's not believing in the others, or prophecy, or that sort of thing. But we want a better answer than that, right? not just disagreeing with the maesters because the maesters are usually wrong about magic. Well, good news. Uh, there's one to be found in another nearby legend, which is that of Durin Godscrief, Fair Elenai, and the founding of Storm's End. This is one of the best ancient legends that George has written for his own world, and it comes from a Catelyn chapter of A Clash of Kings. Now, as you listen to this, try to think like a historical disaster hunter, if you will, and look for bits of the story that might be usable information about what really happened. The song said that Storm's End had been raised in ancient days by Durin, the first Storm King, who had won the love of fair Elenai, daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. On the night of their wedding, Elenai had yielded her maidenhood to a mortal's love and thus doomed herself to a mortal's death. And her grieving parents had unleashed their wrath and sent the winds and waters to batter down Durin's hold. His friends and brothers and wedding guests were crushed beneath collapsing walls or blown out to sea. But Elenai sheltered Durin within her arms, so he took no harm. And when the dawn came at last, he declared war upon the gods and vowed to rebuild. Five more castles he built, each larger and stronger than the last, only to see them smashed asunder when the gale winds came howling up Shipbreaker Bay, driving great walls of water before them. His lords pleaded with him to build inland. His priests told him that he must placate the gods by giving Elenai back to the sea. Even his small folk begged him to relent. Durin would have none of it. A seventh castle he raised, most massive of all. Some said the children of the forest helped him build it, shaping the stones with magic. Others claimed that a small boy told him what he must do, a boy who would grow to be Bran the Builder. No matter how the tale was told, the end was the same. Though the angry gods threw storm after storm against it, the seventh castle stood defiant, and Durin Godsgrief and fair Elenai dwelt there together until the end of their days. Gods do not forget, and still the gales came raging up the narrow sea. Yet storm's end endured through centuries and tens of centuries, a castle like no other. All right, so besides the heartthrob, forbidden romance of fair Elenai and Durin Godsgrief, what actual information do we have here? Well, first of all, it sounds like the tale is describing a huge storm, obviously, but not just a storm. There's definitely a flood here too, or maybe a tsunami, as the tale speaks of winds and waters battering down Durin's hold. 
In fact, it sounds like a real disaster. The winds and waters actually destroyed his castle, and everyone inside was killed, save for Dern and Elenai. So, one time a thing occurred to me. What's real and what's for sale? Sorry, child of the 90s. Um, could this story about a tsunami and a flood at Storm's End actually be the other end of the Hammer of the Waters flood? After all, if you look at the map here, um, you can see that the collapse of the Arm of Dorne was really a huge section of land. And in fact, this Sea of Dorne right here, the maesters are very certain, based on fossils, that this used to be a freshwater inland sea, which means the land that collapsed connected all the way up here to the south of the Rainwood, somewhere near Cape Wrath. So if any large part of this land bridge or this land area, this little triangle chunk of land, if any part of that collapsed suddenly and catastrophically, then it would indeed have sent huge tidal waves, walls of water, just as the legend says, racing up the newly formed narrow sea to smash into various jets of land all along the way, such as Storm's End. In other words, we should find legends of one titanic catastrophic flood and storm in this area, and that's just what we have in the Durin God's Grief legend. And I bet if we could go myth hunting up the shores of Essos there, we'd probably find a few more flood myths, but we'll see. Now, the most important part of this idea that the Durin flood is the hammer of the waters flood is the implication of a changed weather pattern in the Durin God's Grief story. So when the Arm of Dorne collapsed, it joined the cold, shivering sea and its southern extension, the narrow sea, to the much warmer summer sea. And that would have permanently altered the weather patterns of the area and actually the entire world. I mean, just think of our own mid-Atlantic current, which is basically the only reason why Europe isn't as cold as Canada. And of course, if that current or system of currents ever were to collapse due to climate change, then Europe could get much, much colder. So back over in, in Westeros, uh, we have a very dramatic example here of changing ocean currents when these two seas met and put the ocean motion to the potion, when they mingled their waters like Absu and Tiamat of Babylonian legend. That's right, mingling of the waters, it's, it's very sexy. And this would indeed have permanently altered the weather of the narrow sea in particular, just as is recorded in the Durin God's Grief legend. And what I mean is that there was first one big storm and flood, and then, ever after, the storms came raging up the narrow sea. So it's, it's a changed weather pattern that comes after the cataclysm. And that's exactly what we'd expect to find if the Hammer of the Waters event involved a sudden collapse of the Arm of Dorne. So that's pretty much a disaster hunter home run. It seems there was some sort of sudden land collapse and a subsequent tsunami in this area, which was then followed by a permanent alteration of the weather patterns due to the change in the ocean currents. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Hammer of the Waters legend is also associated with the Neck and Moat Kalin. Specifically, it is suggested that a Hammer of the Waters event is what turned the Neck into an inhospitable, boggy swamp that only the Cranog men can survive in for any length of time. At the northern end of the Neck Swamp sits Moat Kalin. One of my favorite places, by the way. It just couldn't be any cooler. And Moat Kalin is, of course, a largely ruined black stone fortress built out of huge basalt megaliths, many of which, or most of which, are now scattered about the swamp. Some legends say that the hammer, either the hammer of the waters or second hammer, it's actually unclear, was called down by the children of the forest from one of the three surviving towers of Moat Kalin, the children's tower, and then flooded the neck and broke Westeros in two. Now, it's kind of hard to picture the children of the forest living inside the black stone walls of Moat Kalin. Doesn't really seem like their vibe, right? I mean, we're told they live in caves, in the deep woods, in cranogs, in secret tree towns. I don't know if, what secret tree towns are like, uh, but point is, yeah, Blackstone Fortress doesn't really seem like their vibe. But what's more important is simply the association here, the idea that the neck has something to do with the Hammer of the Waters. None other than Maester Lewin uh, had this to say about it in A Clash of Kings, although it should be noted that he's sort of trying to spook Theon about the powers of the Cranogmen here, and therefore maybe playing up the legend a bit more than he would at Old Town in conclave with the Maesters. But I'll also point out that Lewin is one of the few Maesters who has 
earned his Valerian Steel link, which means he's studied sorcery. And he does speak of the children of the forest as if they are real. So of all the maesters, Lewin is fairly reliable as far as splitting the difference between magic and science. Anyway, here's what he has to say to Theon. Theon was about to tell him what he ought to do with his wet nurse's fable when Maester Lewin spoke up. The histories say the Cranog men grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the Greenseers tried to bring the hammer of the waters down upon the neck. It may be that they have secret knowledge. Suddenly the wood seemed a deal darker than it had a moment before, as if a cloud had passed before the sun. It was one thing to have some fool boy spouting folly, but maesters were supposed to be wise. So this really is a pretty funny scene. I'm, I mean, the skeptical maesters using old legends to frighten the bad little children. It's kind of almost like he learned a thing or two from Old Nan at Winterfell, right? Anyway, this is the only place, actually, where it's suggested that the hammer of the waters also affected the neck, save for a passage in A Dance with Dragons where Theon essentially quotes Maester Lewin in his inner monologue when he goes back to Moat Caelan. But we can assume this is the consensus wisdom of the Citadel, if Maester Lewin is saying it, based on the legends that they've collected. So guys, the next video in this series is going to focus on Moat Caelan. <laughs> I'm really, it's already written. I'm very excited. I might record it tomorrow night. In any case, Moat Caelan, that's right. Weird ass place that it is. We're going to talk all about it. So I'm going to save the deep dive into the swamps and Cranogs for then. But for now, it's sufficient to simply consider that there are legends that the Hammer of the Waters was brought down not only on the arm, but also on the neck. This suggests that, one, the neck may have, once upon a time, not been a swamp, and that it was flooded at some point in the ancient past, and that, two, this flooding may be connected to the destruction of the Arm of Dorne that is associated with the Hammer of the Waters. It's important to realize that tsunami waves can travel a very long distance all the way across large oceans, as we saw with the Indonesian earthquake and tsunami of 2004. At least those of you who are a little older in the audience, some of you guys may have just been born around. God, I'm old. Anyways, the point is that while the neck isn't in the direct line of fire of the worst of the Hammer of the Waters tsunami waves, it still certainly could have been flooded with salty seawater if it was already a low-lying area. Seawater flooding can, in fact, create a what's called a saltwater marsh. So maybe if there's some biologists in the, uh, in the audience, you can tell me if the descriptions of the flora and fauna in the neck suggest that it is a saltwater marsh or not. It doesn't say. That'd be interesting to note. But yeah seawater flooding can create a marshland. That absolutely is a real thing. So again, we'll go deeper into the marshland, into the bogs of the neck and the deep and dark history of Moat Caelan. Did I say deep? Did I say deep ones? Uh, but I did want to point out now that the, the neck could be related to the hammer so that you can see that there is more potential evidence of cataclysmic flooding of the narrow sea, even beyond the Durin God's Grief myth. There's also the Iron Islands to deal with in a subsequent video in this series. The Iron Islands is on a parallel latitude to the neck, and there's lots of signs of flooding and cataclysm there, legends of flooding. So yeah, we'll talk about that as well. We're not done with the broken arm of Dorne and the hammer of the water, so let's talk about men who wear antler hats. That's right, men who wear antler hats. They're the ones who did it in both stories, actually the Hammer of the Waters legend, and the Durin God's Grief legend. That's right. Not only do the two stories appear to describe the same flood, they also describe the same headgear, the same cosplay, if you will. At least that's what the maesters say is the truth behind the green men cosplay. Surely, they say, there, there are no green-skinned, fawn-like humanoids with antlers on their heads and magic powers that ride elks. That's, that's silly. Uh, the brand believes it, but uh, the maesters do not. I mean, that'd just be too much fun, wouldn't it? Whether the green men still survive on their isle is not clear, although there is the occasional account of some foolhardy young river lord taking a boat to the isle and catching a sight of them before winds rise up or a flock of ravens drives him away. The nursery tales claiming that they are horned and have dark green skin is a corruption of the likely truth, which is that the green men wore green garments and horned headdresses. So, like I said, it's just really, really cool shamanic cosplay. All the green seers on the Isle of Faces cosplay as Garth the Green, just like I do, right? Okay, so to be serious, 
there probably are green men, whatever they are, on the Isle of Faces. And actually check out my Secret Origins of the Green Men trilogy of videos for my best green man theories. We go to the Isle of Langs, all kinds of cool stuff. In any case, we don't need to figure out the truth of the green men for right now. Here's what's important. The Durand and Storm Kings have been known for cosplaying green men. And here I'm not kidding in the slightest. Although they wear yellow and black instead of green, the Durandan kings wore both antlered crowns and antlered helms, like King Robert. And of course, recall that House Baratheon adopted the traditions of the Durandan kings wholesale when they took over Storm's End and House Durandan. Ori's Baratheon, the bastard brother of King Aegon the Conqueror, uh, married the daughter of the last Durandan Storm King and then took up their sigil, their colors, and the tradition of the antlered crowns and helms. So all of that stuff comes from the original Durandan line of kings centuries and centuries ago. So this is actually cosplay, just as people dress up like Daenerys to be imbued with some of the power of Daenerys. The Durandan kings, this is more serious, this is religious cosplay. Um, they no doubt wore antlers on their heads to convey their sort of divine authority because the Garth the Green and Green Man tradition does appear to be the oldest religion in Westeros, to use that term loosely, because of course this is all based on actual magic. But yeah, that's the point of dressing up like a stag man to convey the divine power of the green men. And Garth the Green himself gave rise to a line of green kings of House Gardner. So perhaps Garth the Green, or at least his subsequent Gardner kings, were doing something similar, cosplaying green men to make themselves seem like, like godmen, more godlike just as the ancient Durandan kings may have done. So the maesters, they're not entirely crazy bringing up the idea of dressing up like, like stag people. It's just that in Westeros, that tradition probably goes back to actual stag people. So, yeah. And just as the Reach, where the Gardner kings and Garth the Green legends are from, is also full of legends of the children of the forest. There's weirwoods to be found there. Storm's End, it should be noted, is right next to a giant forest, which is full of weirwoods known as the Rainwood. And in fact, Durin God's Grief was said to have warred against the children of the forest in the Rainwood. Then his son Durin II supposedly gave it back to the children. So it's hard to say exactly what's going on here, but it does seem like the ancient Durandan kings had some kind of relationship with the children of the forest. And then there's also that little bit in the Durin God's Grief Storm's End story where Durin uh, has the children of the forest help him build Storm's End with their magic. We'll talk about that in a future video when we talk about Old Town and stuff like that. But point is, there's some kind of relationship here with the Children of the Forest and the Durandan Kings. So the Durandan Kings, it may be that they didn't just dress up as stag men, but rather that they intermarried with the Children of the Forest or the Green Men and became skin changers and green seers. This is probably the answer. Because of course we know that the first men did that. The Starks, the Blackwoods, the Cranog men, other first men houses, House Crane. So if the ancient Durandan did that, then yeah, it would be right in the pocket for the first men. So when we picture Durand God's Grief as a green man type, either in actual fact or simply by way of cosplay, his story starts to sound a lot like the Hammer of the Water story. In the legend of the Hammer, it's green seers on the Isle of Faces who call down the Hammer to smash and flood the land. And in the Durand tale, it's an antlered king who angers the gods and thereby calls down their divine wrath in the form of a titanic storm and flood that might be the hammer of the waters. Now, small fly on the ointment, uh, the hammer of the water story says that it was green seers of the children of the forest on the Isle of Faces who called down the hammer, not green men. But the green men living on the Isle of Faces are probably green seers. I mean, they watch over weirwood trees and their therianthropic descriptions make them sound kind of like larger children of the forest. I mean, for all we know, the green men may very well be the green seers of the children of the forest referred to in this tale. Or maybe the green men are a cousin species to the children. Or maybe they're a group of men endowed with green magic. All of these possibilities make a certain amount of sense, and really they're not that much different. Therefore, when we hear that the green seers on the Isle of Faces called down the hammer of the waters, it really is pretty similar to the idea of Durin God's Grief the Stag Man calling down the Storm God's Wrath. Going further, I think there's actually another really tight correlation between the two legends, okay? So... It's said that the green seers in the Hammer of the Water story sacrificed either captive humans or their own young 
to power the magic of the hammer. And then just a moment ago, I told you that Durin Gonsgrief was said to have warred against the children in the Rainwood Forest. So perhaps centuries and centuries later, you know, these two tales have grown apart a little bit, but they could be the same story of massive blood sacrifice of children of the forest to call down this hammer of the waters. In other words, Durin is the guy who summoned the storm and he's also remembered for killing children of the forest, just as the green seers who called down the hammer may have killed children of the forest. So perhaps this is all the same story. All right, so this is the part where I spell out my t-shirt joke in case you haven't picked up on it. Uh, this is a Nine Inch Nails joke Monty Python shirt, the knights who say knee, but in the and Nine Inch Nails logo. So Nine Inch Nails, hammer, Knights of Knee, Stag Men. Pretty nice, pretty nice confluence there. Even nicer, and we're gonna do just a little bit of symbolism here. I get to point out one of my favorite symbolic parallels. Uh, Robert Baratheon, <clears throat> Robert Baratheon. The first and most wrathful of the Baratheon Stormlords that we meet in the story, he rides around wearing an antler hat and hitting things with a big hammer. <laughs> a big hammer, the Storm King. The descendant of Durin God's Grief, wearing the Stagman cosplay, which Ned says makes him look like a horned god. And of course, think of Garth the Green here, who's a literal horned god, and beating things with his hammer, a hammer so heavy that other men can hardly lift it. The kind of heavy, huge hammer that could batter the land. Now, the most famous time that Robert used his hammer was in the waters of the Trident. Oh, yes. So, what was the storm called down by Durin God's Grief, the first storm king, the one that battered Storm's End? Was it the hammer of the waters? Maybe, maybe. So just to take the symbolism a little bit further, and I'll use my serious voice now, uh, Robert's ascension to kingship was famously, or rather infamously, enabled, the way was paved, by the bloodshed of children. They talk about this all the time. Rhaegar's children, obviously not children of the forest, but I do believe that that is an intentional parallel. Robert the Horned God is absolutely a very clear parallel to Garth the Green. As I just said, Ned calls him a Horned God. Uh, Robert's many bastard children and his total lack of impulse control, those are both hallmarks of horny old Garth the Green who gets everyone pregnant and is kind of a glutton, just does whatever he wants. And when I say gets everyone pregnant, he's a fertility god. So it literally, it says he makes the land bloom. He makes the ladies, okay, I'm not, it's kind of gross, but you get the idea. He's a fertility god, just as Robert has many bastard children. Um, there's also the scene where Robert, the very first scene we meet him, he shows up to Winterfell boasting to Ned about all the bountiful delights of the flesh that come with summer, the girls, the ripe fruit, that's all Summer King stuff. You can even think of the ghost of Christmas present from the Scrooge story, that, that's the same idea, but sticking with the Summer King thing, Robert eventually dies in his hunting greens from a wound that he took in the woods on a hunting trip, and then when he actually dies, he's cut open and laid out essentially like a sacrificed green man or horned god. The horned god is sacrificed every year with winter, resurrected in the spring. You, hopefully you guys know the story. And shout out to Kernunos for, for what it's worth. So when Robert dresses up in his antler hat and smashes his enemies with his hammer, sometimes while they're in the waters and sometimes to end a war, he's actually doing a smashing impression of the green men slash green seers on the Isle of Faces, who supposedly called down the hammer of the waters with blood sacrifice of children to end their war with the first men. But of course, Robert, again, is only wearing all that getup and calling himself the Storm King in emulation of Durin God's grief, the one who called down his own storm and flood, which we think may be the hammer of the water's flood just witnessed from further away. And obviously I'm saying that the symbolism of Robert is suggesting that they are because he's basically uniting the two stories in his character. And that kind of just shows you how similar the two stories really are. And if they do in fact speak of the same storm and flood, it could be that the stag man calling it down part that they both have in common also has some truth to it, right? Some magical event that they're both describing that involved green men, green seer magic, children of the forest, and obviously blood sacrifice. I don't wanna talk about the pack too much yet because that's gonna be in a future video, but 
I'll just also point out that the legend of the signing of the pact also takes place on the Isle of Faces. It involves giving the weirwood trees faces, but of course we suspect that giving a heart tree a face may involve blood sacrifice again. I'll sort all that out for you, but there are multiple legends potentially on the Isle of Faces that involve blood sacrifice. So that's probably a thing. Now, just to give you a sneak peek of the Ironborn Seastone Chair video, probably the third video, I think, in this series, I'll tell you that the towering figure in Ironborn mythology is called the Grey King, and he too may be an echo of the same storm-summoning figure. Like Durin, the Grey King angers the Storm God. Durin stole the daughter of the Wind and Sea Gods, you'll recall, while the Grey King just taunts the Storm God directly. It calls him names or something, I don't know. But something similar happens. The Storm God lashes down with a great thunderbolt. And of course, hammers, thunder, lightning, they're all tightly associated in mythology. Of course, just think of Thor, the storm god with a hammer that shoots lightning bolts. Thunder sounds like a hammer hitting, you know, you get it. So that thunderbolt may be a reference to the hammer of the waters. And then later on in the Grey King story, after the Grey King's death, the storm god drowns his palace and all his fine treasures. So there's the implication of a flood. And actually more interesting is the tale of the Grey King slaying Naga, the first sea dragon, supposedly, who drowned whole islands in her wrath. Drowning islands is something that looks to have happened at the Iron Islands, especially at Castle Pike, the crumbling stronghold of House Greyjoy, where they keep that sea stone chair. I'll have tons to say about that uh, down the line in this series, but for now, I just want to point out that this other possible echo of the Durin God's grief and the Hammer of the Waters legends exists over on the Iron Islands. And there's a lot more parallels, potentially. Um, the Grey King takes a mermaid to wife, and Elenai, Durin's wife, was the daughter of the wind and sea gods. Uh, so she comes from the sea, and you remember that the people said, give her back to the sea. So Elenai, some kind of mermaid or sea goddess. So that's very much a parallel to the Grey King. And there's also ample clues that the Grey King was a green seer sitting on a throne of weirwood with a crown of weirwood. So if Durin God's grief is a green seer, as I suggested, then these figures are all similar to the Green Seers who called down the hammer. The Ironborn mythology is probably George's best. It's definitely his most elaborate and detailed folklore, so look forward to that video. Like I said, probably third in the series. All right, so far we figured out that there almost certainly was a catastrophic hammer event, that it was of colossal scale, and that it involved tremendous flooding and even tsunamis capable of destroying coastal castles, or inundating low-lying islands or straits of land, even large ones like the Neck. It does seem to be associated with green men, children of the forest, the magic of the weirwoods, blood magic, but as disaster hunters, we're not overly concerned with puzzling out the exact magical mechanics here. It's enough for now to simply assume that we are operating within a fantasy context, that magic does exist, and so we're not looking for purely scientific answers, just coherent ones that seem to line up with the way that George does his world building. So even if we can't say exactly how the hammer was called down, we're, we're doing pretty well. I mean, we've connected what seemed like an isolated myth, the hammer of the waters, to a couple of other ancient flooding events, the first storm of Durin God's grief, the flooding of the neck, and potentially, you know, the Iron Islands. I'll, I'll lay out the proof for that, but trust me, that's, that's part of it too. So we've built up this strong correlation between the Hammer of the Waters myth and the Durin God's Grief myth, right? But one thing that really strikes you at this point is that the motivation of the Hammer Summoner, the Storm Summoner character, is totally different in these two stories. In one story, we have the children of the forest at the tail end of a genocide, desperately trying to stave off eradication. And in the other, we've got this really hubristic, ambitious dude named Durin, who's like, you know what woman would be worthy of me? The mermaid goddess. <laughs> and who then builds seven castles in a row in what seems like kind of a bad spot to build a castle, just to show his defiance to the gods. So they really are different in character as far as the motivation of the storm summoner, the antler hat wearing storm summoner. Now, here's the thing, guys. I don't think the children of the forest dropped the hammer of the waters. It just makes absolutely no sense on so many levels that the children, the nature elves, mind you, thought of destroying the earth in order to protect themselves. 
it's entirely against their philosophy and it's it's exactly what humans would do. So it sounds like humans projecting their own motivations onto the children. And even the maesters point out in the world of ice and fire that it makes no sense for the children of the forest to break the arm of Dorne to stop the war with the first men when the first men were they had already crossed the arm of Dorne hundreds of years ago, and they had already populated Westeros in much larger numbers than the children. That, my friends, is a classic case of what we in the South, I'll just point out my Virginia lasses plate back there, what we call closing the barn doors after the horses have gotten out. And friends, if you didn't grow up near a barn, let me tell you. It doesn't do much good to shut the barn doors after the horses have escaped. You want to do that while the horses are still in the barn. So again, the maesters point this out and just kind of shrug because they probably don't believe the children of the forest did or could do something like the hammer of the waters anyway. And frankly, I'm not sure they could have either. After all, there's really no hint that I can find that green seer or skin changer magic can be used to cause colossal earthquakes. I mean, maybe it can. We don't know the upper limits of weirwood magic, that's true. Uh, but everything we see from the green seers, it's all tied to astral projection, right? The ability to send your spirit out of your body and into an animal, person, or a tree. That's what Bran is doing. He's skin changing the tree. So it's all astral projection magic. And so what, are we skin changing the fault lines here? Are we making the trees wiggle their little root toes hard enough to make all of Westeros shake? I mean, maybe. It's not totally crazy, but I don't know. I'm kind of struggling to picture that. But hey, let's run with the idea for a minute. Maybe weirwood magic can cause earthquakes. The one clue that I could sort of see is in the name of the children of the forest, which is those who sing the song of earth. Singers are what the children call their green seers, and Bran does note that their speech sounds musical like a babbling brook, but maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's a way to sing a song that makes the earth shake. Kind of like the biblical story of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. And Martin was raised Catholic. It's a lot of biblical allusions in A Song of Ice and Fire. And Joshua and the walls of Jericho is definitely one of them. Uh, they blew trumpets and horns to bring down the walls of Jericho. So that seems like an inspiration for the legend of the Horn of Joraman, which is said to be able to wake giants in the earth and thus bring down the wall, the big ice wall. That's all really cool, I think, anyways, but... Now we've gotten away from green seers and tree magic, and we're talking about magic horns. So did the green men on the Isle of Faces blow a hundred magical horns to break the arm of Dorn? Is that a horned men blowing the horns thing? Uh, I mean, it seems like they'd have to be standing on the arm of Dorn if it's a sound vibrational thing. But maybe I'm thinking too literally. Perhaps the song of Earth can cause earthquakes, and that's that. Still, it makes no sense to break the land bridge after it's been good and crossed. And it also seems inconsistent with the beliefs of the children of the forest to damage the earth so significantly to save their own skins. Again, by the time Bran meets the children in Blood Raven's cave, they say that they're content to dwindle quietly into the night, accepting of their fate, and that it is men who would fight and kill and rage against it, but not the children. So maybe in the past, they were willing to fight. They do seem to have fought, you know, for their survival thousands of years ago. So maybe it was different. Maybe their philosophy has changed over time. Uh, but damaging the earth that significantly? I don't know about that. Speaking of harming the earth, I realize I forgot my moon. Moon. Oh, that feels better, as does the removal of the hat. Folks, as I mentioned earlier, there is a notion that the flooding of the neck was actually a second attempt by the children to cut themselves off from the first men by breaking Westeros in half with a hammer of the waters magic event. But the idea is that this time it didn't work as well, so they're only able to flood the neck instead of collapsing the land entirely. I suppose this all makes sense if you believe that it was the children dropping hammers, the hammerses of the waterses to stop the first men. You know, because the first men were mostly south of the neck, so this time at least we're closing the barn doors with the horses inside the barn, if you will. However, if I'm correct that it makes no sense for them to have broken the arm of Dorne or to destroy the earth in an act of self-preservation at all, 
then it also makes no sense to suppose that the children later flooded the neck. More likely, this was all the same flood, and that's why the Hammer of the Waters is also associated with Mo Kalen. A couple of other issues. Um, doesn't really make any sense for the children of the forest to sacrifice hundreds or even a thousand of their own children. We know the children of the forest have very small numbers, and even back then, they had much smaller numbers than the humans. So killing a thousand of their young is such a huge setback in the war that it would invalidate whatever gains they got from dropping the hammer. Uh, and then as far as the idea that the children gathered at Moat Kalen to drop the hammer on the neck, that doesn't make much sense because they'd be standing right where they were dropping the hammer. So they'd be hammering themselves. And I guess maybe that is an act of self-sacrifice, but none of it makes sense. And that's before I really hammer home the nail in the coffin and the nine inch nail in the coffin of the, the, the idea of the children of the forest brought down the hammer of the waters with my earthquaking the ring forts routine. That's right, it's time for earthquaking the ring forts. The fun game that I've been playing here and there for the past eight years or so on forums and Reddit and wherever. So it goes like this. If the children of the forest could cause targeted earthquakes, then why didn't they try earthquaking the ring forts of the first men, where the first men tended to cluster like easy targets? If it takes the sacrifice of a hundred or even a thousand captives to call down a hammer, big enough to break the arm of Dorn, what about trying out smaller hammers on the ring forts first, at much less expense in blood? I'm imagining the, the planning session uh, with the children of the forest. Uh, doesn't one of those little bloodthirsty fucking elves stand up and say like, hey guys, this is all cool, breaking the arm of Dorn and stuff, but doesn't this seem like a bit overkill? Destroying an entire land bridge. How about we just try earthquaking the ring forts first? Their voices are higher pitched, but you get the idea. So not only would earthquaking the ring forts take down large clusters of first man warriors, it would also scare the ever loving bejesus out of them, don't you think? So picture yourself as a first man. You're atop the ring fort in your bronze armor. You're having a snack, some salt beef, maybe some orange slices one of the team moms brought in. You're staring out into the mists, waiting for the wolves and ravens and lions and dragon glass arrows to come again. When a few of the creepy little wood elves march out into the open, slice a couple of throats, uh, then your ring fort starts shaking beneath you. A giant crevice opens up in the earth and half your men fall in. And then the elves casually turn and walk back into the forest. Or maybe they wave their arms menacingly. Uh, it's the earthquakes that are intimidating here, right? It seems like you might find somewhere else to live if you're a first man in this scenario. But we never hear about the children earthquaking any ring forts, not once. And even if you want to mention Moat Kalen as a fortress of the first men that got destroyed by a hammer, that's kind of like earthquaking a ring fort, right? Well, except that the tale says the children are the ones in the fort calling down the hammer. So it still doesn't make any sense. There's no earthquaking the ring forts. It's just wolves and lions and bears and ravens and obsidian arrowheads. And as the histories note, the first men simply overmatched the children with their greater size and their horses and their bronze weapons. And then, out of nowhere, they summon God's own earthquake. An earthquake, we showed it on the map, it's, it's basically the equivalent of like several small countries falling into the sea at once. It's basically unfathomable. And the children of the forest did that. Really? I don't think so. What I think is that the Durin story is closer to the mark. Some sort of hubristic man, likely a magician, seeking to meddle with the primal forces of nature, and then somehow things went very wrong. This is also pretty much exactly what happens in the Grey King legend that we mentioned. It's what happens in the Azor High legend, the Bloodstone Emperor legend, and several others that we'll discuss down the line. I do think blood sacrifice of children of the forest was part of it. It just wasn't other children of the forest killing children of the forest, because again, that doesn't make any sense. So I do think there was green seer magic, weirwood magic, blood sacrifice. You know, perhaps the weirwood magic was the thing that this ambitious figure was trying to control or obtain. But I think there's some other big piece of the puzzle here. Some big piece of the puzzle. Some it's a big piece of moon. If you know me and my channel, you knew the moon meteors were going to come into this. And yes, 
It's Moon Meteor time. If you know the theory already, congratulations. And if not, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Check out the Nightbringer series. This is kind of what I'm known for. It's five videos, it explains all the evidence. It's a lot of fun. I'll come back to this more basically throughout all of these videos, the idea that there's meteors involved. But I just want to introduce now, if, if you're new to this idea, that a meteor or a comet impact could have been the trigger for the Hammer of the Waters event, the earthquake and the collapse of the Arm of Dorne. Instead of the Children of the Forest doing magic, I think it was a meteor strike. All this talk of calling things down, after all, implies that something came down and hard, right? Hard enough that it was like a giant hammer on the land itself. What could that even be besides a meteor or a comet impact? Hammers are made of iron, just like meteorites are. This one's got a bit of lithium in it. Shout out Nirvana. And there's even a fictional book, well-known fictional book by author Larry Niven called Lucifer's Hammer that's about a doomsday comet. In addition to that, meteorites were also called thunderstones by some ancient cultures in our own world, so... This could also be the truth behind the thunderbolts of those angry storm gods in the Durin and Grey King stories. So thunderstones, that's pretty cool. And in A Song of Ice and Fire, of course, as we all know, comets and meteors are called bleeding stars, right? Everyone calls the comet the bleeding star. And the Azor High Reborn prophecy also foretells of a time when, quote, the stars bleed, which can only be some sort of reference to a kind of meteor shower that's coming in the winds of winter to cause the new long night. I've been saying that for about eight years. In any case, we've also got this bad dude from the Far East called the Bloodstone Emperor. I said his name a minute ago. He was said to have taken power over an ancient kingdom called the Great Empire of the Dawn during the long night. And most importantly, he was said to have worshipped a black stone that fell from space. A bleeding star that fell to the ground as a rock, worshipped by the blood stone emperor. Guys, I, I think this guy was named after his magic rock. A bleeding star in the sky would be a bloody stone on the ground. So, yeah, the meteor man emperor, bloodstone emperor, that's him. And that kind of makes sense. I mean, it says he cast down the true gods to worship the black stone. So it really was his thing. So I mentioned the Bloodstone Emperor for two reasons. One, it's just another story about a meteor, and you guys know there's also Dawn. So we know meteors, they're, they're in the legends of the ancient past. There's more than you think, too. Uh, but the second reason is that, <laughs> this is really funny, this is kind of an author clue to the reader, but there's only two named islands in the chain of islands that is all that remains of the broken arm of Dorne. And the largest island... The one that Daemon Targaryen himself takes as his royal seat in season one of House of the Dragon when he declares himself King of the Narrow Sea and buzz in at home if you know the answer. It's called Bloodstone Island. So Bloodstone Island, right there in the middle of the broken arm of Dorne, kind of like a big fat, the meteor did it sign. So what broke this here arm? It was a bloodstone, the bleeding star that fell like a hammer. So let's go back to King Robert and his hammering of Rhaegar in the waters of the Trident. If I'm right that this is giving us clues about the hammer of the waters and Durin Godsgrief and the Green Men, then there could be other clues about the hammer of the waters lurking there, right? So think about this. Uh, Rhaegar, the steel dragon, and his blood-red ruby stones that made up the dragon sigil on his armor were hammered into the waters, very like falling meteors. Now, of course, meteors in A Song of Ice and Fire and in the real world can be symbolized as dragons in folklore and mythology. So the falling dragons are like meteors. And of course, the rubies, calling them blood red, as it does in that passage, implies them as bloody stones, as well as pieces of dragon. So it's kind of a double whammy as far as bloodstones and dragon meteors getting hammered into the waters by Robert. Well, you get it. You get it. So again, I'll point out Daemon Targaryen claiming kingship on Bloodstone Island as that's really just a way of highlighting the connection between bloodstones and dragons and hubristic men that seek power like Durin Godsgrief and the Bloodstone Emperor and Daemon when he declared himself king of the Narrow Sea. Daemon's dragon, Caraxes, is even red, just like Rhaegar's ruby dragon, for what it's worth. So if Daemon taking Bloodstone Island is meant as part of the symbolism, 
Well, his dragon is blood red, so there you go. And finally, Damon also parallels the Bloodstone Emperor, who is a god emperor of the Great Empire of the Dawn, when he gives his amethyst-eyed queen Rhaenyra the Jade Tiara of the god Empress of Lang as a gift. And in case you didn't know, the Amethyst Empress, supposedly the Bloodstone Emperor's sister, possibly sister-wife, and the uh, Empresses of Lang are called God Empresses. So it could be that they married the God Emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn, since the Great Empire of the Dawn included Lang in its territory. That's uh, kind of in the weeds, but it's a pretty cool parallel that involves House of the Dragon. So I thought I'd mention it. So the million dollar question, one we've been working on for a long time, was this hammer really called down? Or another way of asking the question is, can comets be summoned with magic in a song of ice and fire? It's a huge question. Again, been talking about it for years. I think the answer is yes, as the legends suggest. And I'll make a video about that some other time with my theories on that. But whether the meteor hammer was summoned, or if it just happened to fall when it did and then legends about it arose that said people were responsible for it or children of the forest or whatever, that's pretty much what I got for you today. Yes, the Arm of Dorn really was smashed by a giant hammer that fell from the heavens. I think that's the most logical assessment of the evidence as I've laid out, and I'll continue to provide more evidence as we go in this series. So guys, I'll just finish by saying again how cool it is that George has constructed a lot of his old legends around these cataclysmic events that would have been experienced by multiple groups of people in different regions and then encoded in slightly different yet not so different legends and folk tales that can then be coherently assembled and analyzed as if they were real legends of floods and things from the real world. The legends just have antler hats and weirwood trees, but actually a lot of our real world folklore does. And check out the Norse mythology of Ice and Fire playlist for the real world Norse mythology behind the weirwoods, green seers, and characters like Blood Raven, John, and Bran. And again, I'll steer you towards that Secret Origins of the Green Man series. It's got all the best antler hat artwork in it. And uh, cheers, friends. I'll see you next time with a video about who built Moat Kalen and why it was the Squishers. Mm -hmm.